Good afternoon uh, and welcome. My name is Landon King and on behalf of the School of Medicine I want to thank you for joining us on this extraordinary exciting day. Uh, I want to thank all of you who have come here to celebrate with us today including faculty, staff, lab members. A particular welcome to Greg's wife Laura. Congratulations, it is a family affair. Uh, we'd also like to thank members of the Weiss and Grass families for being with us today. They are among the many who have contributed to Johns Hopkins and allow us to pursue the things that we seek to achieve. I'd also like to thank the members of the media who have joined us here today, either in person or, or on by uh, phone or through social media. First, I want to offer the heartfelt congratulations from our Dean and the CEO of Johns Hopkins Medicine, Paul Rothman. Paul is traveling today and very disappointed that he could not join us, but he's incredibly proud about this accomplishment, what it means for you, Greg, and what you've been able to achieve, and what it also means for our institution. We're here today to celebrate the groundbreaking work of our colleague, Greg Semenza. But I want to make sure to mention another Hopkins connection to today's prize. Greg is sharing the award with two other scientists, William Kalin of Harvard and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and Peter Ratcliffe of the University of Oxford and the Francis Crick Institute. In particular, Dr. Kalin did his residency in internal medicine at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, where he also served a year as chief resident. So as we gather to celebrate Greg's tremendous achievements, we want to offer our congratulations to Drs. Kalin and Ratcliffe as well. This is the 14th Nobel Prize associated with the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, one of the many Nobel Prizes awarded to the university. The Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine received more than $700 million in federal funding last year and has been one of the top recipients of NIH funding for many years. As a university, indeed, we are the top recipient of research funding. That funding supports work across the full spectrum of biomedical research. This award, and our celebration today highlight the critical importance of fundamental basic science research in advancing our understanding of biology and our opportunities to improve the lives of our patients. We are investing significantly in basic science research because of our commitment to the importance of this work in advancing medicine. The recognition of the work of Dr. Semenza and his team also provides the opportunity for reminding ourselves of the process and the time required to move from initial observations at the bench to understanding the potential impact of these discoveries on our patients. As Greg will attest to, work of this sophistication and importance takes a village, and we want to take a moment and also congratulate the numerous trainees and colleagues who have made contributions over the many years. In a few minutes, Greg will talk more about his work, but I want to briefly provide an overview. Greg and his colleagues discovered how cells sense oxygen, an essential process for survival. Oxygen is carried to tissues and cells by red blood cells, and when oxygen levels are low, the body generates a hormone called erythropoietin, which signals to boost red blood cell production. In the early 1990s, Greg and his team were trying to understand how oxygen deprivation, called hypoxia, triggers production of this hormone. They identified a segment of DNA, an enhancer element, that is responsive to low oxygen. When put in front of any gene, the enhancer element causes that gene to be turned on when oxygen levels are low. Greg proposed that a protein binds to this element to turn on a specific gene or genes and named this protein hypoxia inducible factor one, or HIF-1. In 1995, Greg and postdoc Guang Wong purified HIF-1 protein and found that it contained two subunits, alpha and beta. In cells, HIF-1-alpha is present in low oxygen conditions, but disappears when oxygen concentrations are high. In 1996, Greg demonstrated that HIF-1 activates a key gene involved in blood vessel formation called vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF. This showed that HIF-1 helps the body cope with low oxygen conditions by triggering not only RBC production, but new blood vessel growth. Greg's discovery of HIF-1 and the research that has ensued has opened up new doors to developing therapies for a number of diseases, including cardiovascular diseases in different organs, metabolic diseases, and cancer. Many tumors draw nutrients by growing extra blood vessels, so being able to turn off HIF may slow cancer progression 
and at least one compound is in clinical trials for kidney cancer. Greg, we're extremely excited for you as you receive this highly deserved recognition and proud to call you friend and colleague. And with that, it's now my privilege to introduce Ron Daniels, the president of Johns Hopkins University. Well, thank you, Landon. I think it's fair to say it truly doesn't get any better than this. And today, I'm thrilled to be here with Nobel Laureate uh, Adam Reese. Where is Adam? Sitting over there. Um, and it's good you, find, you got a chance to uh, say hello to one another now that you're both in this illustrious club. Is Peter Agre here? I know Peter saw you earlier, Greg, but uh, I know Peter was hoping to be able to join us. Uh, Provost Sunil Kumar, of course, he was like a Vice Dean Landon King. Uh, Laura, it's great to see you here and celebrate this moment. And all of you, as we join the Nobel Committee in honoring the remarkable, remarkable scientific achievements of Greg Semenza and co winner Peter Radcliffe and Dr. William Kalin, who, as Landon noted, trained here at Hopkins as an OSO resident. I know we have a lot of people here to thank, and I'm sure Greg will have many uh, in his comments uh, for arriving at this moment, starting, of course, with Greg's parents and uh, going forward from there. But I'd like to call out one who might be missed, and that is Rose Nelson. She's not a winner, not a previous Nobel uh, winner uh, related to Hopkins, or indeed hasn't won a Nobel of any, uh, associated with any institution. Uh, Rose was, in fact, though, really instrumental in bringing, this to, uh, bringing us to this day. She was Greg's high school biology teacher, who herself, herself held a PhD, I understand, and understood the power, the importance, the allure of basic curiosity-driven scientific research. Craig has often credited her with, as he says, transmitting the wonder of biology and the excitement of understanding a subject at its most fundamental levels. And clearly, Greg, you have built an extraordinary career from exploring that wonder at the highest echelons and digging in deeply, incrementally, to the fundamentals of human physiology. Indeed, it was your commitment to exploring and explicating these fundamentals with your own postdoctoral student that led to the discovery, which Landon has referred to, that we are celebrating here today. A discovery that I understand could have been missed had it not been your drive to scrutinize punctiliously and unrelentingly the many results from your many, many, many experiments over the years in an effort to discern patterns that would generate insight and understanding. One day, of course, while pondering the meaning of a series of negative results, you held up a gel shift assay and saw a faint image. And there it was, HIF-1. As we know from what Landon said a few moments ago, hypoxia-inducible factor one, a protein that helps direct a cell's response to low levels of oxygen, has informed our understanding of a staggering array of biological processes. Or, as you so simply put it, in ways that even a law professor could understand, uh, hold your breath for 20 seconds, and you know right away how important oxygen is. I got that. More than 30 years, ago, uh, you asked that central question, how does this system regulate itself? It's a delivery system that makes Amazon Primes look rudimentary. But thanks to your tireless efforts, we are closer than ever to understanding it and all its richness and complexity. And as you well know, your discoveries have led to momentous advances in human health and well-being for people suffering from cardiovascular disease, of course, a condition that causes veins to know and heart issue to be starved of oxygen. HIF-1 can play a life-saving role by activating genes that support the creation of blood vessels. And thanks to you, your co-winners and collaborators, we now know that HIF-1 can help us formulate novel treatments for everything from deadly cancers to diseases related to aging. So, today, we recognize and celebrate a career marked by a passionate commitment to the wonder of basic science and its profound connection to improving and saving lives. But we also, we also celebrate those mentors like Rose Nelson and most important, like you, Greg, who have instilled in others both the wonder in science 
a capacity to pursue its fundamentals day upon day upon day in order to advance knowledge that serves humanity. And we know, Greg, that though this honor is a profound, indeed a momentous one for you, that you will be right back in the lab tomorrow, if not later this afternoon, to continue doing the work that you have done for decades and continuing it honoring that great pursuit. So, Greg is the 28th Nobel Laureate associated with Johns Hopkins, a prestigious list that gives great pride to our entire community. I'm delighted that we can pause here today to applaud this matchless accomplishment together with his friends, colleagues, students, and of course his family. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Johns Hopkins' newest Nobel Laureate, Greg Semenza. It's a good day for Hopkins, I think. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, uh, believe it or not, this has been a really lousy year for me. Um, uh, May 31st, um, I somehow ended up uh, walking through the hallways of my home in the middle of the night and uh, fell down a flight of stairs and broke uh, my neck. I fractured four cervical vertebrae. And um, it was a pretty serious uh, injury. Uh, fortunately, I was, uh, um, I, I got to Hopkins and a very uh, talented uh, neurosurgeon named uh, Ali Biden put me back together again. And um, it was funny because he told me afterwards that he did, when he operated on me, he didn't know who I was. And he said, if I knew who you were, I would have been so nervous. <laughs> but uh, the, the point is, he did a great job, and um, I have very little, um, uh, very little deficits uh, as a result of uh, his great surgery. And uh, for me, that's sort of the way it's been my, my whole career here. Um, there have been lots of times when I needed help, and there was always someone uh, on the faculty or the staff here who helped me. And uh, yeah, I've been able to do what I've been able to do here at Hopkins, and I really don't believe that I would have accomplished this anywhere else. Um, and th that's why I've stayed here my whole career, uh, because I think this is the, the greatest place to do research. It has the greatest colleagues and the greatest sense of collegiality um, of any place I know. So there are places where uh, there are lots of smart people and know how to do all sorts of things. There are places where everybody is very friendly, but there are very few places that have both of those, like Hopkins, where there's always someone who knows what you need to know and they're w willing to help you. And, uh, and, and that really started for me as a postdoc. Um, when, when I started uh, this project, kind of from scratch, and this is like a crazy thing for a postdoc to do because a postdoc doesn't come into a lab and just start a project. They work on something in the, um, the mentor's lab. And I was very lucky that I had mentors in Hey Kazazian and Stelios Antonarakis that allowed me to pursue this project even though it was not, um, it was not part of their general research program. Um, and, uh, we were lucky in terms of being able to make some discoveries and we would have uh, hit the road because uh, we had identified the factor but we were trying to clone the DNA and we, had, we were trying to use expression library cloning and it didn't work and we had screened millions of clones and I guess we had several, I had several choices 
We could continue screening and continue to get negative results, and that didn't sound like a good idea. Um, we could uh, give up and let somebody else do it. That didn't sound like a good idea. Or we could uh, take a different approach, which involved the biochemical purification of the protein. Uh, and uh, that was daunting because my lab was a molecular genetics lab. We didn't know anything about um, protein purification. Uh, we didn't even own a fraction collector. Um, but uh, Tom Kelly's lab was across the street. It was one of the first labs to purify a protein based on its binding to DNA. And, and with the assistance of his lab, we were able to purify HIF-1 from 100 liters of HeLa cells grown in suspension culture. And, and we know the, the heritage of HeLa um, here at Johns Hopkins. So um, it's been a, it's been a a great time for me here at Hopkins, um, and uh, as I said, a lot of people helped me. I've tried to, I've tried to return that by uh, mentoring students, and that's one of the major enjoyments I have. In addition to doing our research, is to mentor students both in my lab and uh, elsewhere. And the the message that I have for everybody who's here, who's training today, is that. Um, uh, I was once where you are now, and um, someday you will be where I am now. Um, and uh, I, I think that we're, we're very lucky to have this career where we get to follow our, our interests and dreams and crazy ideas uh, wherever they lead. Um, and uh, people will pay us to do this. We have friends all over the world that share our passion in for research, um, so it, it's a really great career. People often complain about grant writing, um, but I always say that's the only bad part of the job, um, and the rest of it is fantastic. And you know, when you think about it, we're very fortunate to have a career that we actually enjoy doing, um, because so many people have jobs uh, to pay to pay the bills, basically, um, and. People say, well, you work very hard, but come on, it, it's, it's in, we enjoy every minute of it. So uh, I, I've been very fortunate um, in the sense that um, I, I, I was brought up by my mother uh, along with my four other siblings. Uh, she was an elementary school teacher, and um, she was uh, very supportive of, uh, of uh me all, all along the way, uh, and I was I was fortunate to be able to get involved in research fairly early on uh, in high school and and then in college, um, and really fortunate to to come to Hopkins um, to to start work. We we originally started work by making transgenic mice uh, that express the human EPA gene with um, John Gearhart, and um, again. I was a postdoc coming to John with a with an idea, and there was no reason that he he had to say yes, uh, but he did, and and that started uh, started things on the way. Uh, I've been very fortunate that uh, the administration here has been so supportive. Uh, Ron Daniels invited me to lunch at at Homeward, I think seven years ago, and, and we had a great talk about what I was doing. And uh, Ron and uh, Paul Rothman, I'm sorry that he's not here today because I, I, I know he, he would like to be here, uh, have been incredibly uh, uh, supportive of the work, as has uh, Dave Valley, uh, who's now the chairman of the new uh, Department of Genetic Medicine. And, and uh, Dave has been my boss for quite a few years and uh, has been, uh, again, very supportive of, uh, of all the work we've done. So I'm really uh, blown away by the number of people here. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's been a really amazing day. Uh, and like I said, this is, a, this is a award that's shared by everybody at Johns Hopkins, uh, past and present, uh, because uh, I couldn't have uh, done it without you all, including all of my trainees, um, I've just been really fortunate to have a, a, a long list of, of superb um, postdocs and graduate students and uh, undergraduate students who work in my lab. 
And the great thing is that um, th the students come and go, and every year there are new students. They remain young, and as long as I don't look in the mirror, um, <laughs> there's no aging going on in the process. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I enjoy it so much and um, have so many great people who have, who have worked with me and are, are working with me now. And everybody who knows our lab knows that um, it's, it's filled with great people who are always willing to help. So thank you again for coming. Uh, I know I've, I've forgotten uh, to thank a whole bunch of people, and I, I apologize. I'm sure it'll come to me about two seconds after I leave the podium. Um, but my day started before 4 a.m., and it's been nonstop since then, and I did have a little bit of champagne, I must confess. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, uh, before I turn the microphone over to Landon King, who's going to uh, uh, preside over uh, some questions for the press, there's just two things I, I, I need to share with you, Greg. The first thing is um, that following the tradition that has been inspired by Elizabeth Warren at all of her rallies, and now apparently has set a standard and expectation for those in receipt of the Nobel Prize this year, you're going to be expected to stay until everyone here gets a <laughs> selfie with you. So, you know, he's got nothing left to do today. So, the self... Just 450 emails to respond to. Yeah. <laughs> but the selfies are part of it. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, uh, Landon's going to officiate, but I want to get the first question. And, of course, it has to do with uh, the call you got this morning. Is it true that you slept through the first call? Yeah, I'm a deep sleeper, so um, <laughs> I did wake up eventually, but by the time I got to the phone, it was too late, and so I said to myself, oh, boy, I wonder if this is somebody's idea of a bad joke. Um, so I went back to sleep, or tried to, and it was quite a, quite a few minutes. I think they were debating whether to call me back or not, but <laughs> fortunately they did, and I was a little faster to the phone the second time around, so... This is what we say, uh, you know, same as in uh, research, my first uh, advisor uh, when I was an undergrad, he used to say search and research, so you're not always going to get it right the first time. Greg, thank you for the inspirational words and certainly for the work, uh, and thank goodness they didn't say who's next. <laughs> so uh, we're going to open it up for questions from the press, and we'll start with those who are here in attendance. Do we have questions? Yeah, that's, that's a great question because that's really what it's all about. Um, and so it, it turns out that because oxygen is so critical to life, many of the common human diseases um, have derangements in, in the ability to maintain proper oxygen levels. So for example, in a cancer, the cancer cells divide very rapidly, uh, consume a lot of oxygen, and the, the cancer cells become very hypoxic. And what we've learned is that when they become hypoxic, they turn on genes that enable them to invade, metastasize, and spread throughout the body. And whereas um, most of the chemotherapy drugs are designed to kill dividing cells that are well oxygenated, there are no treatments uh, that are approved to treat the hypoxic cells within the cancer. And we believe it's these cells that survive the therapy and come back uh, and kill the patient. So one of our um, major goals is to try to identify drugs that will inhibit uh, HIF activity 
uh, as an addition to existing uh, cancer therapies, and, and we hope that that will help uh, to improve outcome in, in a number of solid cancers where once the, the cancer has metastasized, there, there, there aren't really effective therapies. Then on the other side is the um, cardiovascular disease where the blood vessels, for example, in the heart can become narrowed, reducing the blood flow to the heart, um, causing the heart to have uh, ischemia, which is uh, injury due to the lack of oxygen. And uh, this, of course, can ultimately result in a heart attack. And we know that um, the hypoxia-inducible factors stimulate um, new blood vessel growth. They, they stimulate the remodeling of blood vessels to increase flow to tissue. And, and so we hope that uh, there may be the possibility for new therapies to increase um, the perfusion of ischemic tissue uh, in diseases like uh, coronary heart disease and also um, limb ischemia. Uh, which is a major problem, particularly in diabetics, leading to, um, in some cases, uh, limb amputation. Um, and so there, there are a number of disorders where um, we hope to make an impact. The one that's going to occur first, I think, is chronic kidney disease, where individuals with chronic kidney disease um, cannot make EPO, and as a result, they are anemic. Um, they originally, of course, required blood transfusions and often came down with transfusion-associated um, viral illnesses like AIDS and hepatitis. When EPO was cloned, it was possible to generate uh, the EPO protein in the lab, and, and um, that's now given by injection. There are drugs now that are in clinical trials that will induce HIF activity, and these drugs can be uh, delivered as a pill. So um, this will be, I think, a major advance in the treatment of anemia, and there are over 25,000 people in clinical trials now for these drugs. So uh, I suspect that um, one or more of these drugs may be approved in the next uh, year or so. So I, I, I think that there are some clear applications uh, and many more, I think, that will follow. Say again? Yeah, I think that we have um, a sort of a new target for therapy, um, and, and the hope is that have it, by having a new target, we may be able to significantly improve uh, outcome in a number of diseases. But again, uh, you know, as you heard, research is a, a process that occurs in um, uh, some leaps and bounds, but mostly in small steps, and particularly when it comes to developing new therapies, um, the road is, is, a, is a tough one. So, um, and we understand that, that, that it would be difficult to develop these new therapies, but certainly in my lab, that's what we're focusing on now, is to try to um, move these discoveries uh, to the clinic. Additional questions from the media? Yeah, so uh, Rose was an amazing woman. She was uh, under five feet tall and always had a beatific smile on her face. Um, and she had, uh, as, as you heard, uh, received a PhD and done a postdoc at Woods Hole. So she knew what research was about. And so when we learned biology, we didn't just learn the facts. We learned who made the discovery. When did they make the discovery? What were the experiments that they did that led to the discovery. And what a wondrous thing it is to be able to learn something of fundamental importance in biology. Um, and, and she used to say to us, she used to say, now, when you win your Nobel Prize, I don't want you to forget that you learned that here. Um, <laughs> and she just assumed that one of us was going to do that. Um, and it's uh, my great sadness that she's not uh, still alive to share, share the moment because I, I know um, it would have meant a lot to her. But yeah, she was my inspiration. Uh, and I think that, um, boy, that's the importance of teachers um, to serve that kind of, make that kind of spark. And certainly in this country, we need to give more emphasis to teachers 
um, and to reward them for the hard work that they do, which makes such a difference in the lives of so many. Uh, other questions? I think there might have been a second question from... Nothing. <laughs> it was, uh, I was in a daze, um, and uh, yeah, I was kind of half awake, and um, yeah, it was, it was kind of uh, uh, a kind of, just, uh, I, I, you know, I was not able to really say much of anything <laughs> because I was so shocked and, and, um, and surprised. Uh, as I say, particularly uh, given the, the experience I've had over the last several months, uh, it was certainly not something I was expecting. Other questions from the media that are with us here? Amy, do we have any uh, questions from the teleconference line? If you'd like to ask a question, it is one and then zero. And our first question will come from Nikki Notizia, Indio Asia News Service. Please go ahead. Doctor, um, my question is, what does your work mean for patients who are currently undergoing chemo? Thank you. So the, the question is, as I understand it, uh, what, what does our work mean for patients who are currently undergoing chemotherapy for cancer? Um, in the case of kidney cancer, there's a, a, a drug that inhibits one, one of the hypoxia inducible factors, HIF2, that's in uh, clinical trials and um, showed some remarkable results in a phase one trial. So I think that um, kidney cancer may be uh, the first uh, cancer where uh, a, a drug that blocks HIF activity um, may um, may uh, be added to uh, therapy. We certainly think that there are many other types of cancers um, that uh, may benefit from a HIF inhibitor. We've uh, spent a lot of time and effort in the lab, all the folks in my lab studying breast cancer, um, where we find that, that HIFs play a really critical role in um, the progression to metastatic disease and the ability of the cancer cells to um, uh, shield themselves both from the immune system and from um, uh, therapies. So in, in the long term, we hope that there will be many cancers where a, a HIF inhibitor may be beneficial, and in the short term, it looks like kidney cancer may be um, the, first, the first such case. Other questions, Amy? Yes, the next one comes from Tina Say, um, Science News. Please go ahead. Hi, I was. Oops, one moment. Tina, you have dropped off. If we push one zero. And you may begin. Okay, hello, uh, Dr. Semenza. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your work intersects with that of the other two laureates and whether you ever worked directly with them. Uh, yes, so uh, for the most part, the three labs have worked independently, although we have uh, collaborated on, on some projects along the way. Uh, so w we uh, discovered HIF-1, uh, showed that it was induced by hypoxia, and then the question was, what was the molecular mechanism by which the um, the activity of the protein was induced under low oxygen conditions. And Peter Radcliffe and Bill Kalin's lab showed that the, pro the HIF-1 alpha subunit is subject to a, a post-translational modification, uh, which is a hydroxylation of a proline residue. And th they went on to identify uh, the uh, enzymes that carry out this modification, and they're called prole hydroxylase domain proteins. And these uh, proteins use oxygen as a uh, substrate. And they insert one oxygen atom into HIF-1-alpha, and by doing so, um, HIF-1-alpha becomes recognized by a protein called the von Hippel-Lindau protein, VHL. And when VHL binds the hydroxylated HIF-1-alpha, 
it targets the protein for degradation. So when we're under our normal uh, conditions where we're getting plenty of oxygen, the HIF-1 alpha is hydroxylated and degraded. Then under hypoxic conditions, the hydroxylation reaction is inhibited uh, and VHL cannot bind to the protein and HIF-1 alpha rapidly accumulates within hypoxic cells. Uh, now, apart from showing the molecular mechanism, the other part that was important here is that um, the enzymes that were discovered use both oxygen and a small molecule called alpha-ketoglutarate as substrates. And this is important because it then became possible to develop drugs uh, used that were alpha-ketoglutarate analogs. So they would bind to the enzyme, um, but rather than activating it, would inactivate. And so the drugs that are being developed to treat anemia in chronic kidney disease, these drugs bind to the hydroxylases in the region that would ordinarily be bound by alpha-ketoglutarate, and that's their mechanism of action. So really those discoveries uh, uh, enabled a, a, a number of uh, groups and pharmaceutical companies to develop drugs um, that uh, appear to be very uh, potent uh, inducers of uh, HIF activity and uh, red blood cell production. Thank you. Amy? Thank you. And as right now, there is no further questions. Okay, thank you. Kristen, do we have any Twitter questions? No? Okay. Well, uh, any other questions from the media here? Right, so we, when we started the project, as I mentioned, we were working with John Gearhart in making transgenic mice that express the EPO gene, and we were interested in the fact that the gene is expressed in the liver during fetal life and in the kidney in adult life. And we um, identified sequences that were required for expression in the kidney and the liver in uh, transgenic mice. And so after we had sort of explored the tissue-specific expression of the gene, um, then it became obvious that the other really interesting aspect of the regulation of the gene was the regulation by oxygen concentration. And for those studies, we went into tissue culture cells where we could expose cells to different oxygen concentrations. And other labs had shown that in these cells, EPO was induced. Um, and then uh, uh, we, uh, using those cells, we identified the particular regulatory element that was critical in the EPO gene and then use that to um, identify and then purify HIF-1. Great. Any other questions from the media? We're open to the audience. Sure. Uh, dare we take some questions from the audience? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Oh. oh, hey, Stuart. <laughs> Thank you for that, Stuart. Um, now, uh, you know, we have to uh, put a disclaimer there in that uh, Stuart and I and many, many members of the Johns Hopkins faculty are the editorial board of the Journal for Clinical Investigation. This is a journal that's run by scientists, for scientists. Um, so the answer to your question is, is no. When we... Um, when we uh, wrote our manuscript reporting the um, discovery of HIF-1, uh, we uh, submitted it to these uh, so-called top-tier journals, and they did not find it uh, to be of sufficient interest to warrant publication. <laughs> Uh, I was very fortunate that Victor McCusick was one of my mentors, was a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and, and Victor had the paper reviewed for PNAS, and it was accepted, and it's been cited over 5,000 times. Uh, do, do we have any other either setups or general <laughs> questions? If not, oh, please. Yes, uh, th that's a great question. So the, um, the ceremony will be on December 10th 
in uh, Stockholm, and anybody who's been in Stockholm in December knows that it's uh, the sun is up for a few minutes about. Um, but I think it, it'll be a, a, it'll be exciting nonetheless. Uh, I did have the opportunity to speak at a Nobel forum uh, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, so uh, and then I was a, a speaker at the Karolinska Linska Institute a couple of years ago. Uh, that talk, fortunately, was in the spring and in the daytime. Uh, so uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's going to be a very exciting. Uh, particularly because I'll have my family and, and, and good friends with me. Um, so I look forward to that. Other questions? Please. Well, yeah, so the, the, I think the key is that what makes it ex exciting is we never know um, which way the work will turn. We never know what will be the critical experiment. Um, so we just, you know, continue every day to, tr to try to generate data to move, uh, move forward. Um, and I think the, the joy has to be in those small steps every day. Um, and then, uh, of course, when we write the papers, uh, you know, for me, that's, that's one of the best times because we get to see really how much progress we made um, and, and then to share it with the world. Um, and I tell all my students that the, your papers are your legacy. Uh, they, they'll live forever. Um, and so we want those to be um, really uh, works of art. So th that's, uh, that's the approach that um, I, I, I would take is just to continue to you know, focus on every day on, on your experiments and generating data, because that's what we do. We generate data. We don't um, you know, try to show this hypothesis or that hypothesis is correct. We just use those uh, hypotheses as a way of trying to understand the universe, right? Past, present, and future. And um, so, yeah, the key goal is to generate data that's reproducible that we know will stand up to uh, other people doing the same experiment and getting the same result, and we'll move the field forward. Sounded almost like a bridge to Adam Rees. Uh, other questions? Please. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how it'll affect my daily life and career. I'm very happy with my life and career as it is at the moment. <laughs> so I hope not too much. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, ma'am. So uh, the question is about physician scientists and the, I guess their importance in research. And so I trained as an MD, PhD, and uh, my clinical specialty was medical genetics, which I was able to do for a few years. Um, and uh, I really enjoy doing it um, because I think that, first of all, patient care gives you a very uh, critical perspective on doing research. Um, it's why you do the research, at least it's why I do the research. And when you see the, um, what families go through, for example, with, uh, with diseases, it uh, kind of gives you some perspective about the ex your experiment that didn't work and you're going to have to do again. Uh, it, this is not a great tragedy in the great scheme of things. So uh, first of all, I think it gives really a certain perspective uh, and motivation for, uh, for doing research. And I guess I felt that by having both research and medical training that um, I was best suited to kind of be at the bridge between the two and, and to try to take basic science knowledge and hopefully help to have it translated to the clinic. Um, it's very difficult to do both research and clinical care. Uh, as many of the faculty know, 
Uh, I stopped doing clinical care about 15 years ago. Um, and, uh, the, you know, it's, it's just very difficult now. It's difficult to do research 100% of, the, of your time, much less less than that. And I do worry uh, how much it's going to be possible uh, with all the pressures on people, both in, in terms of medicine and research, um, to have those kind of uh, dual careers. But I think they're very important. Uh, for uh, for studying disease and for de for developing new therapies. Well, Greg, thank you for being here. It's an extraordinary day in recognition of an extraordinary body of work. Thank all of you for being here. And if you're interested, we have a reception upstairs on the way outside of Turner Auditorium. So thank you for coming. Thank you.